um, the victory um, had many dimensions, but to probably the the sweetest definition of the um, uh, of that victory and that achievement, uh, that historical achievement, could be expressed in some you know statistics, very simple statistics, fifty four point eight seven percent against, and forty five point one three percent for, and um, with those figures. Um, with those figures reflecting what happened, the referendum was lost. Um, so you brought us together today, but yesterday, last night, Philip, you also brought a very significant group of people um, at a face-to-face -face special dinner at the Tats Club in Sydney. And uh, uh, I'm going to invite you um, after... Nick speaks to perhaps tell us a little bit about that dinner because it was a very, um, from all reports, motivating and uh, special feeling dinner. And it was tremendous that you were able to, um, again, put a, a, a great effort like that together and make it the success that it was. Um, we have apologies from Senator the Honourable Eric Kibetz and the Honourable Louise Archer uh, both very strong supporters and members of AML. Uh, they cannot be in attendance at this webinar today because they are involved with the Liberal Party annual conference in Tasmania. And it's only because of that that they are not participating and they send their strong and sincere apologies. Of course, we should remember um, broadly um, far too many to name um, the many members of the AML and monarchists who did so much and fought so hard um, during um, the referendum and particularly in the lead up to referendum day, November the 6th, 1999. Um, so many of those, uh, Philip calls them comrades, but so many of those very, very um, distinguished Australians, prominent lawyers, politicians, industrialists, um, you know, people who who had already made a very substantial contribution to the social, economic, political, cultural fabric of Australia. They put their names and their reputation and their status um, alongside the many millions of, let's call them ordinary Australians, but uh, there was nothing ordinary about Australians who had the foresight and the motivation to fight to preserve constitutional arrangements that had served Australia for well over um, almost a century and they decided with the majority of Australians that um, those constitutional arrangements should not be tampered with and so they put their shoulder to the wheel and the referendum result was what it was and um, but we recognize and we honor in a broad sense uh, far too many to mention individually the memory of those that did so much and who have passed on to what we're, I'm sure we all want to be just rewards. Um, so I think it's my, um, my real uh, privilege and pleasure to introduce um, a really good friend of mine, uh, the Honourable Nick Minchin, who um, played a most significant part, um, a most significant role in the um, successful um, no campaign um, uh, the, the referendum fight in 1999. Um, Nick was, in fact, the minister responsible for organising and running um, the Australian Convention um, that then led that led into the referendum, and he took over basically the role of CEO of the convention. And um, just reading some of his comments and and the comments of many others that were made around about from February 19, 1988 onward, 19, February 1998 onwards. Um, it was just like herding cats, Nick, I'm sure you'll, you'll reflect, um, you know, the changing positions of the various parties and interest groups. Um, it would have been an exasperating, incredibly difficult, complex convention for you, you know, to handle, but, um, I'm happy to say on the record here that you're one of the ultimate um, organisers, always diplomatic, always courteous, but very determined to make sure that conventions and courtesies, professional and personal are extended. 
And in the end, you ran a very successful convention on behalf of the government in your capacity, um, in your capacity as special minister for state, which meant that, you know, in a, in a, a administrative point of view, that the convention was yours to run. Um, by the time that the referendum uh, came, um, Nick was a cabinet minister and Prime Minister John Howard, the Honourable John Howard, basically um, entrusted Nick and the Honourable Tony Abbott to be, um, I suppose, uh, the leading exponents of the no case. And it was trust that was um, well justified by Prime Minister Howard. And, um, and from that point onwards, uh, Tony and Nick just did a magnificent job in galvanising public opinion, in presenting the arguments in such a crisp, concise, understandable um, way that the Australian public really got to know the power of the no case, thanks to the advocacy of um, a lot of people, but, uh, but uh, in particular, uh, Nick Minchin and Tony Abbott as the leaders of the um, no case. Um, the beauty about um, somebody like Nick is that he remains a very committed constitutional monarchist um, like me and I imagine everybody else uh, participating in this webinar. There is, um, you know, there is a continuing commitment um, for us to remain alert and vigilant against what uh, continuing often um, sotto voce insidious attempts by Republicans to um, continue their quest for a republic, but uh, but with good people like Nick and Philip and, uh, and 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 everybody else that's involved in this webinar and many more beyond Scott and Rachel and Jeremy, I think that um, Republicans will be very wary of going the full hog again. So, with those few words of introduction, could I invite Nick to reflect, to reminisce, um, you know, be anecdotal, but also for you know, look towards the future and perhaps give us some words of encouragement and guidance in relation to what the future may hold. Nick, over to you. Well, thank you, Santa. And thank you very much for that kind introduction and uh, good evening, everybody. I, I should begin by uh, congratulating the Australian Monarchist League on celebrating this 21st anniversary of what was an extraordinary victory and, uh, and, a, and a great day uh, for all of us uh, on the Monica's side of, of the debate. Um, and I congratulate you on holding the dinner last night, which I look forward to hearing about, and congratulate all those involved who played such a critical part in what was uh, an astounding victory. Um, it, for me, it was um, like a, a precursor of um, what we've seen in recent years, the, the Brexit uh, campaign and Trump's first win in 2016, it was a classic case in Australia with that referendum of uh, we so-called deplorables against the elites. Um, and uh, it was extraordinary, the range of forces lined up uh, against those of us arguing to retain the status quo. Um, I mean, just as Trump has just faced in the United States, we had you know, big business, big media, big unions, all of the Labor Party, the Greens, and, and regrettably, may I say, half the Liberal Party um, and various you know, Liberal and Labor state premiers around the country, all um, campaigning for uh, a yes vote and doing so with the full backing of the media. And it wasn't easy for us to get our message out against that incredible uh, array of forces lined up against us. and and. And really, we won because we, we ran a great grassroots campaign. Um, while the elites were all having their cocktail parties in the eastern suburbs, we were out there, you know, banging away at the message among ordinary Australians and getting the message through that we shouldn't put at risk uh, this, this magnificent constitution, which we are blessed to have. And one of the only ones in the world actually voted in by the people, a people's constitution. Um, there was, uh, in terms of, you know, lining up against all these people, I'll never forget when Rupert Murdoch himself, who I otherwise admire as a, a remarkable businessman, um, personally intervened in the campaign to argue 
um, to abandon our constitutional monarchy. <laughs> I, I came out very strongly in the media and, and um, demanded that this American citizen, uh, Mr. Murdoch, stay out of our, um, our campaign, our, question, our debate about our constitution, uh, and stick to running his media empire in America. And, and I remember some old uh, uh, left-wing journos like Alan Ramsey and others who were just um, astounded that someone like me would come out and attack Rupert Murdoch for his intervention. Um, and, and, and one of the difficulties for me and Tony Abbott, and I was a you know, cabinet minister by this time, was that half the uh, coalition cabinet, of course, were out there arguing the case for this outrageous republic. You know, people like Peter Costello, Robert Hill, my leader in the Senate, uh, Amanda Vanstone, all these people were out there every day banging away in favour of this dreadful republic. And it was, I remember taking on uh, Peter Costello in one um, uh, event I attended where I, I quoted back at Peter his criticism of the model that was being put to the people that he made at the Constitutional Convention. And Peter got very upset with that. Uh, how dare I quote him back at him? Um, but, uh, you know, he had said at the Constitutional Convention that this was a, a pretty dreadful model. So I thought it was fair game. But it, it meant, you know, we were really sticking our heads above the trenches and, uh, and, and it wasn't easy. Fortunately, Peter and I were able to um, uh, maintain our friendship. But, you know, there were moments like that that, that, that weren't easy at all. Um, I, I think we succeeded because we had a very simple message. And I know this was controversial to some, but we formulated a very simple message. Say no to the politicians of the public. And that's what really cut through. And, and, and you know, the, in campaigning, what you've got to do is target your opponent's weakness. And the Republicans' great weakness was that um, they were divided over the model. The model that went to the referendum was the Australian Republican movement's model. It's the one they wanted, um, but they were divided over it. And it was a model that was unpopular with the public. So that was our key to victory, to ram that home. This was the ARM model was a model that would just leave the politicians in charge of deciding uh, who would be our president. And, um, and that was the thing that really, really carried the day for us. I know Tony and I got criticised as politicians for, for running this campaign based on don't let politicians decide, you know, who the president's going to be, but it, it worked. And in campaigns, you just got to find the message that's going to work. And that's what we did. And we did it, I think, incredibly successfully. May I say, just in relation to the Australian Republican movement, we were blessed that they ran a terrible campaign. Um, Malcolm Turnbull typically ran a very arrogant campaign as chairman of the ARM. Um, it was run out of the eastern suburbs. It never connected with the Australian public. And I think for me, the worst moment of the whole uh, referendum was the night of our victory when Mr Turnbull stood up and attacked John Howard for, quote, breaking the nation's heart which was a disgusting thing to say when John Howard had done everything that the ARM had wanted. He had a, he organised a referendum. He put the Republican movement's preferred model to the people. He himself as Prime Minister stayed right out of the debate. He thought that was the honourable thing to do and he left it to people like uh, Abbott and me to, to run the campaign. I mean, he rang me about five times a day to, to check on how it was going, but he did not intervene at all. So it really was deplorable for um, um, the ARM and Mr Turnbull to attack Howard after the event. Um, so really, I think I, I'm happy to make other remarks, but I'd like to give other people the opportunity. But it really was an extraordinary victory to defend our great constitution against the um, incredible campaign that was mounted to upend what is one of the world's most successful constitutions. Thanks, Dando. Look, there were wonderful insights. Thank you very much, Nick, that you have provided to us, which I've made some notes and perhaps in my concluding remarks, I'll summarise the insights because I think that they actually represent lessons for the future. And um, can I say that we thank you and uh, we salute you for the sterling effort 
um, that you um, that you put in on behalf of people who wanted to preserve a status quo that was still capable of serving the best interests of the nation. And um, you know, we owe a lot to people like you and Tony Abbott and and John Howard. And it's just really interesting to to hear those perspectives, which are based on experience from somebody like you, who I regard as one of the um, greatest campaigners that Australian politics on both sides of the fence has produced. So um, Nick, thank you for those um, really pertinent, worthwhile and experience based um, remarks. Um, when uh, you, we, you might come in again and comment later on. Um, can I now go back to Philip? Um, and Philip, um, you, you'll be introducing the other um, panellists who will be making prepared contributions, Scott and Rachel and Jeremy. But before you do so, would you perhaps, um, uh, before you introduce the first uh, of our other panellists, you know, just maybe give us a couple of minutes on the experience of last night, the special dinner that you convened. Thank you very much. Uh, last night, uh, we held a celebration uh, on the actual day of the referendum, the 6th of November, uh, to um, both celebrate our victory uh, and to honor uh, those of our comrades who fought so hard in the 1990s and who are no longer with us or who are infirm and unable to join us today. Uh, we were restricted to 30 people, uh, but everybody had an extremely enjoyable time. It was the first function that we had been able to hold since uh, July, where we, uh, at, at which time we had a lunch. Uh, so um, uh, it was a good time held by all and promises that as we start to get used to this virus uh, and protecting ourselves, uh, we look forward to future functions. So thank you very much, Sandra, and thank you very much, Nick, for your excellent comments. I remember well coming up to Canberra to meet with you in 99, 98 and 99, uh, and um, how uh, helpful uh, and generous you were. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce uh, Rachel Bales, uh, who is one of our spokesperson. Um, Rachel joined us at the age of 14, I think it was, uh, and um, uh, from uh, uh, Melbourne uh, and has been with us uh, ever since and is now a stalwart of our organization. So over to you, Rachel. Thank you, Philip. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all. I first would like to acknowledge Philip, our National Chair, the Honourable Nick Minchin, the Honourable Santo Santoro, some of our participants, Mervyn and Annual, Tim James, my fellow panellists and all guests and members. Tonight, I'll be sharing a brief childhood anecdote of the referendum result we are celebrating with this webinar. I say childhood because I was six years old when the 1999 referendum took place in November of that year. I recall sitting with my parents in their bedroom as they listened to the results of the survey come through on ABC Radio 774 here in Melbourne. My parents groaned as they heard the outcome. I asked them, as I often did, what the news was all about. They explained that there was a question put to the Australian people as to whether Australia should still have a queen. I asked them which way they responded. They said, well, we voted to remove the queen, of course. You see, my parents were children of the Whitlam years. I actually read the results of a study a couple of years ago that found from a series of opinion surveys that children who were aged 11 during the Whitlam dismissal, that is Australians born in 1964, are the most likely to be Republican from a demographic perspective. Well, in 1975, my mum was 15 and my dad was 12, so they weren't far off. To my parents, as for many of their generation, idealising Australia as a republic in 1999 was for them about cutting ties from the mother country, enacting egalitarian values, and perhaps cutting down a few tall poppies along the way. 
In a national culture where the likes of Ned Kelly and Peter Lawler are our cult heroes, this is not surprising. Because my parents are children of that Whitlam era, galvanized by, galvanized by such a flashpoint moment as the dismissal, which has been conjured back into our national consciousness in recent times by the publication of the quite frankly underwhelming palace letters. But me and my schoolmates were not bogged down by any such cultural baggage. I grew up with the same enduring queen on the back of my coin, just as I woke up, just as I saw the same prime minister, that being John Howard, appearing on my television screen each evening when we watched the news after dinner. I had no recollection of Prime Minister Keating and the ushering in of new leadership, which being, being a new prime minister in Kevin Rudd with the 2007 election was very unusual to me. I remember reading the words in the age the next morning, Prime Minister Rudd, and finding it so strange to hear those words, Prime Minister, uncoupled from the surname Howard. From a child's eyes, I was used to a world where change came slowly, incrementally, and there were many symbols of continuity. So an economic climate of relative prosperity and a stable political culture, where our prime minister at the time encouraged Australians to feel comfortable about our history and place in the world, may have set the scene, however subconsciously, for my response to my parents that morning, when they heard of the no victory in the 99 referendum. Why would you wanna get rid of the queen? I asked them in horror. Six-year-old Rachel couldn't believe that my parents had come down on that side of the equation. Why were my parents reading me storybooks where the good guys were benevolent kings and queens while voting to get rid of our benevolent queen and our well-functioning system? Well, 21 years later, an avowed monarchist, I'm asking the very same question. Our queen has served this country in her unique capacity as queen of Australia with distinction over almost seven remarkable decades. In this crazy year, and in the wake of such political instability in Canberra over the last 10 years, we should cherish and celebrate the institution of the monarchy as a bulwark of freedom and tradition and a restraint on self-interested power. I am so proud of my country for collectively refusing to ditch the crown across almost every state and territory, every creed, color and generation, even at the height of Republican fervor in our society. I remain convinced that if the same question were put to the Australian people today, it would be even more resoundingly defeated. While the referendum was a hard fought and won battle requiring much stamina and many resources from our side, what it gifted our movement is a popular ratification of our queen and constitution, a very powerful weapon in our arsenal for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. I'm sorry for that delay. Uh, sometimes things don't work as fast as we would like them to. I'd now like to invite Jeremy Mann to say a few words. Now, Jeremy heads our young monarchists in Victoria. And of course, Victoria uh, was the state that was just, it just passed the line uh, from voting for a republic. Uh, so over to you, Jeremy. Thank you, Philip, for uh, organising tonight's event. And I'd also like to share what an honour it is to be speaking alongside uh, the Honourable Nick Minchin and the Honourable Santo Santoro, two stalwart former senators and advocates for our monarchy. Um, the referendum that we're celebrating tonight occurred two years before I was born, which is quite indicative of, um, of I guess, my, my age and experience. So unfortunately, I can't share with you uh, any great stories of sitting in front of the television and watching the referendum results come in as Rachel just did. Uh, but what I can share is that this major political decision of our democracy made by the Australian people has had a major significance on my life and the lives of many young Australians that I know and do not. Uh, this is in terms of, I guess, the idea of political involvement and uh, long-term stability of our government, uh, which is something that we as young Australians all enjoy uh, today. Uh, as the youngest member of the AML team, uh, I'll just touch briefly on the involvement of our young people uh, within our movement and the relevance of this historic victory uh, that occurred 21 years ago to young people in our great nation. Uh, first of all, I'll start off by talking about uh, the need for engagement among uh, our youth and I guess building up passionate young monarchists to take the movement forward into the future. 
I think uh, looking at uh, over the last two years that I've been involved with the AML, there's really a great importance in, in, in bringing young monarchists together in some form of community. And this takes place through uh, the number of social events that we hold quite often, but unfortunately haven't been able to do so this year. Um, I'm grateful for having the opportunity to serve as the inaugural chairman of the Melbourne University Monarchist Society, uh, which we've just established over the last three months uh, on campus. And uh, next year, we're, we're looking forward to holding trivia nights and uh, potential debates with Republicans, free barbecues, and as well as other events to promote our great cause. Uh, as well as this, uh, our, our Victorian Young Monarchists and the other youth branches on the uh, east coast of Australia have had the opportunity to meet with leading monarchists uh, in the form of a number of politicians that have come and spoken to us. And just last week, we had uh, Senator Jim Molan uh, come speak to our, our organisation, as well as Senator Erica Betts, uh, who's obviously quite a uh, proficient uh, member of the AML, who, who came and spoke to us as well a few weeks ago. Um, I was also lucky to participate in uh, the media training for the spokesperson role uh, in Sydney last year. And this is a great program that gets young people involved in our organisation and uh, given them the skills to, to really go forward and represent our movement. Uh, the importance of having uh, young monarchists as well really uh, comes down to the, our, our key point, which is fighting republicanism, uh, both on campus and in the community as well. So uh, it's, it's quite important to acknowledge that uh, conservative issues alike uh, that are quite popular among young people are synonymous with uh, the idea of monarchism. And it's important to reach new audiences and, and engage in some form of bipartisanship as well. Uh, secondly, uh, one of the most important things for young people is uh, the education on our constitutional framework and our system of government that we have in Australia. I can tell you uh, the amount of times that I've been in school uh, and had someone come up to me and ask, who's the president of Australia or not even know uh, that we have a queen, for example, as our head of state. And I think that's important that, uh, that you know, people are thinking that you know, somehow we elect our, our head of state, just like we've seen in the US over the last few days unfolding. So it really just shows that there is a major need for proper formation and civic education within our schools and within our communities for young people. Uh, we do want to build up a, a really strong knowledge base for, the, for our nation's youth and uh, I guess some form of active young citizenship as well. And, and the, the most important thing being uh, a great love for our, for our queen and for our country. And this really leads into my last point, uh, the idea of the use of social media being imperative to engaging with young people and younger audiences. Um, so I've had the pleasure of, uh, of engaging with uh, the, the great pirate Peter Fitzsimons on Twitter. And, um, and, and it's, it's been a, quite an enjoyable experience to reach out to him and have him uh, come back with some, some snarky remarks. But I guess also the use of, of things like meme pages that we've had um, and our, our Facebook and Instagram accounts that um, we use and our, our young media spokespersons use to promote uh, upcoming events and, and also uh, historic moments as what we're celebrating tonight. Um, I'll just acknowledge as well that the ARM uh, has recently hired a new social media manager, which they've used to promote um, new forms of graphics and, and, and other promotions for their, um, their lost cause as such. And this is an issue in, in some senses. Uh, it's important for our movement as well to, to make sure that we are adapting to new forms of technology and new forms of uh, marketing and promotion to really get our movement out there. Um, and of course, this comes back to uh, the event a few months ago regarding the palace letters, which of course was a major loss for the Republic movement and, and some form of uh, shooting themselves in the foot. I guess going back to this issue uh, and, and the palace letters and, and, and the so-called dismissal as such, uh, it really does have no relevance to young people. And I guess it's really a question of Whitlam who, um, you know, young people today don't associate our system of government with something that happened over 50, 60 years ago. And so I was actually grateful to receive uh, this, this copy of, uh, of Professor Hawking's book for free from the left wing student magazine at our university, uh, which will definitely come in handy uh, should there be any future toilet paper shortages in Melbourne. Um, but again, it really goes to show that this isn't a relevant issue and it's important that as monarchists, we frame it in a positive way to uh, strengthen our movement. Um, so I'll just finish with uh, reflecting back on the referendum as well. If Republicans were successful in 1999, which thankfully they weren't, I never would have had the chance to live in this great system of the constitutional monarchy that we have and we're so lucky to have in Australia. So to conclude, we must protect the monarchy for our future generations. And that is the very goal that I and my fellow young monarchists, including those that have joined me tonight, are proud of fighting for. So thank you.
Thank you very much, um, Jeremy. And now I'd like to introduce Scott. Uh, Scott Coleman is the secretary of the ACT branch uh, of the Australian Monarchist League. He is on our national council. Um, Scott is an expert in all things monarchical and advises us tremendously. So over to you, Scott. Good evening, Philip, and uh, good evening to uh, the Honourable Nick Minchin, the Honourable Santo Santoro, our other distinguished guests, and to the members of the Australian Monarchist League. Now, I vividly remember uh, the Republic referendum. Uh, I remember when it was fought and when it was won, but being all of nine years old at the time, I was, alas, far too young uh, to take part in that campaign. Growing up in Canberra, it was almost a foregone conclusion uh, here that the Republicans uh, would win that referendum. But I remember the relief my parents, grandparents and family felt uh, when uh, our system of constitutional monarchy was upheld and when the special role that the Crown and Constitution play in our nation's life were, pres were preserved. My grandfather literally wept with joy at the result. And I remember one of my best friends in the playground the following week, we had made a bet, he being a mini Republican and I being a mini monarchist um, as to the outcome of the referendum. And I walked away with a grand, um, a grand win of 50 cents. Now, recent history has shown I think the dangers which arise in countries where politicians hold every reign of power without a sovereign and a constitution like ours. And I'm really thankful uh, to live in this great country under a sovereign who is above politics and a system which ensures that the people decide uh, who governs. The AML has continued uh, the fight uh, since 1999, defending the crown and supporting the queen, uh, the servant of the Australian people. And we must continue the fight to make sure that Republicans never gain the, uh, the upper hand again. My admiration for those uh, gallant few who stood up for our way of life under the crown knows no bounds. And my generation and those generations which have followed and which will follow owe you a great debt. I'm proud of the, I'm really proud of you. I'm proud of the AML and uh, proud to play a small part in this organization, which continues to play uh, a vital role in defending uh, our constitution. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I now have a video from uh, Laura Smith. Uh, Laura is the chairman of the Young Monarchists in New South Wales and is also on our National Council and is a great assistance to us in the national office here. So I'll just share my screen and uh, the video from Laura. Good evening, and may I just say, I am so sorry that I am unable to attend this evening's fantastic virtual celebration of 21 years since the No Campaign triumphed back in 99. I'd really like to thank all of the AML members and volunteers who put their lives on hold to promote and defend when necessary, our constitution, our monarchy and our way of life. Because of their efforts, the Australian people voted no. And those of us who are not yet born or old enough owe them and you a great deal of gratitude. Sadly in 99, I wasn't old enough to vote, but I'm happy to say I went to a primary school where the staff and teachers didn't project their personal opinions, on this matter anyway, upon my fellow pupils and I. 
In fact, we were openly encouraged to question as many adults as we could about the referendum, each side and its argument, and if they were willing to share how they were going to vote. And upon reflection, I must have been a very annoying child because I can remember pestering adults. Just before the real referendum happened, my school was having our own referendum and debate. And after questioning so many adults, I decided that I had formed my own opinion, so I was going to give it a go. And when I was signing up, one of the ladies said, so what side will you represent? And I can distinctly remember saying, isn't it obvious? I'm staying with and defending no. I like how things are and they should remain this way. And I'm happy to say that along with Australia, most of my school voted no. I'm really happy that I found the AML many years ago because I'm surrounded by so many like-minded individuals. Whether you be a constitutionalist, a monarchist or royalist, we all uphold the same values. This is why I'm really sad that we're currently in a pandemic because the international state and territory borders are halting our gatherings. But the webinars such as this one have been really fantastic. And I really look forward to the day where those borders will not prevent us from shaking hands, having a cup of tea or something stronger. So stay safe and God save the Queen. So th thank you very much, Laura, and all of those who have participated in this webinar. I'd just like to say that the victory of 1999 was not just a monarchist victory. It was a people's victory because it was the people who came out against all expectation and voted for the Queen and the Constitution and against the huge array of big business, politicians, the elites and others. Once again, the polls got it wrong, but that was because the ordinary person in the street was not going to tell anyone how they were going to vote. There were members of the Labour Party and unions handing out leaflets on, a, on the referendum day at the polling booths. But when the time came for them to go in and vote, they passed volunteers for the no side and said, now we're going to vote for you lot. It was a very divisive time, but I'm afraid that the issue of a republic continues to be divisive even until this day. The main reason why a republic is still alive is not due to that person with the red rag on top of his head, nor is it due to the intellectuals or the media it is because in 1991, the Labour Party adopted a republic as a part of its platform. The index to their platform states, Labour believes in an Australian republic where our head of state is one of us. One of us, perhaps Bill Shorten, Anthony Albanese, Kevin Rudd, Dan Andrews, I could go on. The fact is on the one side, we have the Queen, then Prince Charles and then Prince William. 
represented by an Australian Governor General. And on the other side, we have who knows what. If a republic were not part of Labour Party policy, the issue would be dead or dormant because there is no one out there in the community apart from a few diehard Republicans who cares the slightest bit about a republic or even the monarchy or even the constitution. They just want to get on with their lives and be left in peace. This is because the constitution is like a clock ticking in the background. Few people know how the intricacies of a clock works. Similarly, they have little idea of how our constitution works, but they know it does and they rely upon it. In 1999, we fought not just to keep the queen or the traditions that surround the monarchy, but mainly we fought for the crown within our constitution because it is that crown that protects and defends the liberty and the freedom of the Australian people something no political president could ever do as well. If the crown were to be removed, it would be replaced with a set of laws and a constitution based on the state itself, based on politicians. In 1999, people came together from all walks of life to stand up to defend our constitution. At that time, there were two national organizations, the Australian Monarchist League and Australians for Constitutional Monarchy. I would like to pay tribute to the members and to the supporters of both of these organizations and of the myriad of smaller organizations that were out there fighting against a republic and ensure 21 years and more of stability. These are the people who should be thanked. Later on this evening, if you open a bottle of wine or have a whiskey or any other drink, alcoholic or not, why not raise your glass and toast all those brave people who stood against the Republican avalanche of the 1990s to defend our liberty and our freedoms. Thank you very much. I would now like to hand over to Santo for closing comments. Well, look, first of all, thank you very much for those stirring and uh, inspiring words, comments, reflections. Um, you know, we really all do appreciate the uh, the incisive, dedicated and very focused leadership that you provide to us all on a continu continuous basis. And I, I admire, I marvel at the um, level of energy, um, commitment, uh, dedication that you bring to the course, something that you have been doing over a you know decades and decades and uh, you know i particularly appreciate it if, if people are wondering why you know does somebody you know like me who was born in a little village in sicily on the slopes of mount etna am a committed um monarchist and uh, um it's first of all because i appreciate the great benefits of being a citizen of a great nation like australia um govern under rules that have their bases and their roots in the constitutional arrangements that um, that we all enjoy and all of us seek to preserve. Um, but one of the major reasons why I'm involved in um, AML is because I see um, the efforts of Philip has been extremely worthwhile supporting. And I particularly appreciate the way that he seeks to involve 
um, the younger generations, younger Australians, because, you know, people like Philip, myself, um, I dare say Nick, although he is um, possibly excluded from the category of people getting on, but um, but it's, it's so important that uh, younger Australians be involved, be incentivated, be educated to the issues in relation to the issues and uh, the philosophical underpinnings, the constitutional underpinnings of our cause. And Philip is very committed to encouraging young people to take on the mantle, to take on the job of protecting our um, very worthwhile constitutional arrangements. And, and this is one of the reasons why I support Philip and AML um, to the extent that I'm able to support it in whatever capacity I can bring I can bring to the table. So Philip, um, you know, you are, you know, a really, you know, tremendous inspiration to so many of us, all of us, including, including uh, me. And I just wanted to put that on the record because I gathered that um, this webinar will be uh, put on, um, will be put on the, the AML website, will so shortly be loaded up to the AML website. I just want my views to be as known um, because, you know, you are just such a worthwhile person in terms of all that you bring um, to bear on, on the issues that we have been discussing. Um, I just want to congratulate all the panelists, including, including um, the young ones and Nick, I'll include you in that, you know, there was Scott and Jeremy and Rachel um, and, uh, you know, just so, um, so inspirational to see young people, some who weren't born in 1999, talk about their commitment and their understanding. Um, um, you know, I can't forget Laura Smith either. Um, as, as a young uh, monarchist, a member of, of the AML, um, uh, you, you know, you young people inspire people like me to contribute whatever I can to the cause because I know that um, when my time comes to, you know, shuffle up the mortal coil, there are very, very good people that will keep on protecting, you know, a system from uh, that I have benefited greatly from and that I know my, you know, two boys, Andrew and Lachlan, and um, all of our younger relatives and family members will continue to benefit, benefit from as long as we fight as hard as we have been fighting to preserve it. Um, you know, what are the lessons? You know, we we just been learning and listening to lessons, some of which some of which we are familiar with and others that are really worthwhile reinforcing. You know, we represent um, grassroots. Um, the other side basically represents elitist views and the elitists. Um, our message um, is worthwhile and it is simple. And because it's a simple and worthwhile message, um, we'll be able to uh, continue to enjoy a real ability to keep on putting it out there in, in the community, in the broader community, and with confidence that it makes sense. It really makes sense. And uh, God willing, it'll be continually listened to. Um, uh, Nick mentioned that, uh, that one of the reasons why the referendum in 1999 was successful is, be taught, is because it targeted our opponents' weaknesses. Um, and the major weakness of our opponents was that they were divided, the division within their ranks. And uh, <clears throat> therein lies a lesson for us, um, <clears throat> us monarchists, constitutional monarchists, all strands, I suppose, of sometimes <coughs> slightly differing opinions within our ranks. Um, we must avoid at all you know, possible cost um, divisions within our broader ranks. And, uh, and I was just so happy, you know, and so again, grateful for the insight and leadership provided by Philip when he thanked everybody um, who contributed to the success of the no case in um, November 1999. Um, you know, Philip, despite, um, you know, from time to time niggling and provocation, you continue to be generous towards everybody who are uh, supporters of of our cause. Um, the other thing, and again, I draw on what Nick said, um, it's important that, that what we are about is driven by 
the citizens of Australia, of which politicians are part of the cohort of citizens, but it should be a cause that continuously is, is continuously driven by non-politicians. And I think that, you know, that is a very worthwhile objective and a very worthwhile concept to keep in mind and, um, and, to, and to drive. In other words, leave it to the people because invariably, despite the fact that sometimes we may disagree with some of the decisions that are made by the people, eventually they turn out to be um, the, right, um, the right decisions. And we should always maintain you know, a sense of dignity, a sense of tolerance, a sense of understanding why um, in a democracy we must accommodate different views. We must never be arrogant to the point where we believe you know, that our views are, you know, uh, so correct, so um, so worthwhile, and of course they are, but we should always promote our case and promote our views with a sense of <coughs> dignified optimism and dignified dedication. So look, I think it's been a wonderful webinar. <coughs> I'm slowly losing my voice. I'm not used to making long speeches these days as I used to. Um, but can I thank all the panellists, um, including um, our convener, Philip um, Benwell, for um, you know making the event that we have just participated in such a worthwhile and fulfilling occasion. Um, I'm going to go home shortly and I'll be enjoying a barbecue with my family. And I certainly will be um, raising a glass of good red wine, first of all, to the happiness and the good health of all of you. and all of our other monarchist friends throughout um, throughout Australia, but also to the continuing good health of our gracious um, Queen, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, her, hair, her heirs, and um, and all the people that support the great cause that uh, that we support. But m most importantly, uh, the people of Australia who um, you know who had the pleasure and the privilege of living in the greatest country in the world. You know, when we see what's happening in so many other parts of the world, um, we, sh we, we should and we must consider ourselves truly blessed to be living in one of the great countries, in one of the great democracies of, of the world, in the history of the world. So God bless you all. God bless Australia and God bless the Queen.